We have now to see how this process of this pure notion of recognition and the duplicating of self-consciousness in its oneness appears to self-consciousness. At first, it will exhibit the side of the inequality of the two, or the splitting up of the middle term into the extremes, which, as extremes, are opposed to one another, one being only recognized, the other only recognizing. What we just developed in the last few paragraphs was what we're referring to now as this pure notion of recognition, the pure begriff or, or concept of recognition, something that is not yet entirely developed. Because remember, whenever we have something that's immediate or, or pure or anything like that, Hegel is just prepping us for a dialectical ride in which we're going to see a lot of development taking place. So in 185, the question is that he's beginning with is how does this, this process appear to self-consciousness? What's our starting point, we can ask? We, we just did this whole interesting dialectical thing of the other is related to me and the way that I'm related to the other. That's not how it pans out at first, though. He says that it, it takes place through a kind of inequality. This is an interesting step. Why can't it just simply happen in terms of pure reciprocity? For Hegel, here's one answer to this. For Hegel, there is no primitive human state in which we were all equal to each other and all recognizing each other, a wonderful original condition from which there was some sort of fall, you know, whether it was offending the gods in some way, or whether it was, you know, the development, a la Rousseau, of uh, technology leading to self-consciousness, leading to, you know, inequalities, or any other sort of answer like that. He, he would reject anything along those lines. As we develop as human beings out of our primi prim primeval condition, or whatever it is that, that, that you know, preceded human awareness, you know, determinately human self-consciousness, he thinks that we emerge into a state of inequality in which recognition is taking place, but it's a, a one-sided recognition. And he'll talk here about, you know, two extremes uh, falling out from this, this middle term, right? He says, um, there's a splitting up of the middle term into the extremes, which is extremes are opposed to each other. That whole mediation thing that we saw going on is now no longer happening. Instead, we have one side that is recognizing and the other side that is recognized. One side is acting, we might say, and the action is that of recognition of the other, but it's not getting the same thing in return. So it's, it's you know, losing out by the deal, we might say, if we think of this in transactional terms. And one of the things that Hegel doesn't say in, in this that we ought to really keep in, in mind is what I put here as a question mark. What is the action of the other extreme, of the one who is recognized? How does it come about that this one is doing the work of recognizing and getting nothing in return? Does that require some sort of previous action? on the part of this one to, you know, benefit at, at the expense of the other psychologically or in terms of, of its importance or essentiality. That's a good thing to keep in mind as we move forward. Self-consciousness is, to begin with, simple being for self, self-equal, through the exclusion from itself of everything else. For it, its essence and absolute object is I, and in this immediacy or in this mere being of its being for self, it is an individual. What is other for it is an unessential, negatively characterized object. But the other is also a self-consciousness. One individual is confronted by another individual. Appearing thus immediately on the scene, they are for one another like ordinary objects, independent shapes, individuals submerged in the being or immediacy of life. For the object in its immediacy is here determined as life. 
They are for each other shapes of consciousness which have not yet accomplished the movement of absolute abstraction, of rooting out all immediate being and of being merely the purely negative being of self-identical consciousness. In other words, they have not as yet exposed themselves to each other in the form of pure being for self or as self-consciousnesses. Each is indeed certain of its own self, but not of the other, and therefore its own self-certainty still has no truth. For it would have truth only if its own being for self had confronted it as an independent object, or, what is the same thing, if the object had presented itself as this pure self-certainty. But according to the notion of recognition, this is possible only when each is for the other what the other is for it. Only when each is in its own self through its own action, and again through the action of the other, achieves this pure abstraction of being for self. The key question in paragraph 186 then is, if we're starting to proceed with this notion of recognition, well, why doesn't self-consciousness have the recognition of the other? We saw that you know, there, there can be an inequality in which there is a recognizing and a recognized, and each self-consciousness can ask of itself, why am I not getting recognized by the other? And in asking that, there's a kind of dynamic that is going to play itself out, leading ultimately to what Hegel's going to call the battle to the death. And we're not quite there yet. What we want to see is what steps we need to take to get there. Another way of looking at this, as he talks about it there, is, is why do we have self-consciousness in a, a situation, and both of them are in this same situation, by the way. I, I've represented it in a somewhat asymmetric way, but both of them are symmetrically in the same boat. Why is it that self-consciousness can be certain of itself, but that self-certainty doesn't possess truth? So here's the, the key idea that's being developed here. He says, self-consciousness has these different characters, or, or you know, it, it's got these features to it. It is, to begin with, simple being for self. Right? It knows what it is, or at least it thinks it knows what it is. It has some sort of reflexive relation to itself, self-equal through the exclusion from itself of everything else. So it excludes everything else. That is what allows it to have a self-equality that is self-certainty, right? It's going to say, I know what I am because I'm not that over there. I'm not any of that stuff. I'm not the things that I'm eating. I'm not the things that I wear. I'm not my relations with other people. I am I. I am me. And everything else is, is what it is. So he says, for it, its essence and absolute object is I, right? Put here, you know, its essence is to be an I, to say, I am the one who exists. I am the one who matters. I am the one whose perspective has to be taken into account for myself. At the same time, the other self-consciousness can, of course, do the same thing and is, in fact, doing the same thing with itself. So it says, he goes on and he says, um, in this immediacy, right, immediacy always a bad thing from a Hegelian perspective, or not necessarily a bad thing, it's the first stage in the development, it's not the whole story. In this immediacy or in this mere being of its being for itself, it is also an individual. This is important. To be an individual, particularly if we're thinking about things in a Hegelian way, where you've got like a whole universe of connected things that not only you know, are at this particular place and time, but stretch throughout human history backwards and forwards. To be an individual, to some degree, means to cut yourself off. You know, um, Hegel was somebody who liked uh, Spinoza's notion that every determination is in some respect a negation, a pushing aside, a pushing out of, of one's perspective, that of, of others. So he goes on and he says, um, what is other for it is an unessential negatively characterized object. This is the first way in which it relates itself to the other. The, you know, it can, it can be an individual by not being the other things which don't really matter, mattering, importance, essentiality is on this side. That doesn't go on for very long, though, right? As we've seen. He says, but the other is also a self-consciousness. The other is another individual. Um, 
an individual confronted by another individual. Now we have a relation between the two. And both of them can ask, hey, why aren't you recognizing me? Well, I'll recognize you after you recognize me. I want some recognition from you. Even already contained in that is the notion that the other is a being capable of providing to oneself what it is that one is capable of providing to them. So that's very important. He says, appearing thus immediately on the scene, they are for each other like ordinary objects, independent shapes. They are in relation to each other as objects, as the, what he calls independent shapes here, as something that is possessed of subjectivity, is possessed of importance on its side, but not completely, right? Not as much as me over here on this side. There's another problem too. They are both, as Hegel says, immersed or submerged in the being or immediacy of life. That is, they have determinacy. Um, they have not yet gone through a very important harrowing process. Um, he says, the object in its immediacy is here determined as life. I am related as a desiring being to another living being. We've seen this already play itself out in the earlier paragraphs of self-consciousness, haven't we? So we're, we're sort of bringing ourselves back up to date at this point. And he, he goes on and he says, they are for each other shapes of consciousness which have not yet accomplished an important movement the movement of absolute abstraction, of rooting out of all immediate being, and of being merely the purely negative being of self-identical consciousness. So they haven't removed themselves from the immediacy of life yet. Neither, neither one, neither side of this has done that. He goes on and he says, in other words, they have not yet, as yet, exposed themselves to each other in the form of pure being for self or self consciousness. What does this mean? They have exposed themselves to each other, or they have run across each other, they have encountered each other as living things, as simple beings for self, but not yet as uh, beings for self that have developed to a certain extent, that have gone through an important experience. He says uh, they have not yet become aware of the, each other as self-consciousness is in their full extent. He says each is indeed certain of its own self, right? There's this, this relation of saying, I am, I know who I am. I don't know who the hell you are. I, I understand who I am. I, I don't get you, so I'll push you over there. And the other guy's doing the same thing at the same time. Or it could be, you know, um, a man and a woman. It could be two friends. It could be whoever, right, the, in these encounters. So he goes on and he says, um, each is indeed certain of its own self, but not certain of the other. Each does not have a grasp of what it is that the other is, other than it being another individual, another self-consciousness. But what does that mean to be another me? Are they exactly like me? Clearly not. So what do these differences matter? Are they a threat to me? I don't know. Are they going to affirm me? I'm not sure. We can go on and on and on with different modalities of this. So he says, um, therefore, because they're not certain of the other, its own certainty lacks truth. Remember how this play of certainty and truth has gone on throughout this entire uh, dialectic. You know, you often get one and then lose hold on the other. We want to have both at the same time. We want to have self-certainty that is at the same time a developed self-certainty, not an immediate one, so it also possesses truth. There, you might say we, this is self-certainty or certainty taken to a higher degree. When you have the, the certainty of certainty, you actually have truth, but you only have that through a process of assuring oneself. And in this case, the process is going to be recognition. Not just an epistemological process, but an interpersonal process. This isn't something that one could do a la Descartes in a stove heated room all by oneself. This is something that has to be carried out with determinate human beings engaging with each other. So it makes it much more difficult to pull off. So he goes on and he says, 
Um, it would have its truth only if its own being for self had confronted it as an independent object. If its being for self is over here on the side of the other, then it can actually make that into an independent object that it can try to grapple with. Notice that this requires a sort of loss of being for self that we saw happen earlier. That's what makes the other kind of scary, kind of threatening, kind of anxiety provoking. You know, I lose my essentiality into the, the whatever it is of the other. I don't know what they're going to do with it. I don't know if they're going to take good care of it, if they're going to turn it against me. I have to take a risk in order for that to happen. So he says, it would have its truth only if its own being for self had confronted it as an independent object. Or, what is the same thing, if the object had presented itself as this pure self-certainty? The other gets to be self-certain. And then as I confront that, I can take stock of what my own self-certainty means. So he goes on and he says, according to the notion of recognition, this is possible only when each is for the other what the other is for it. Only when there's a kind of reciprocity. Only when in saying I, I am also at the same time gesturing towards the you and vice versa. Now, this is possible to, to, you know, take place not only in positive ways where we're all, you know, one big happy family on the same page with each other, everything is blissful, but much more often in terms of negative relations with the other as well. So he says, only when each is for the other what the other is for it, only when each is in its own self through its own action, and again, through the action of the other, achieves this pure abstraction of being for self. Only when that occurs, this abstraction of, of being for self occurs, this externalization, this sacrifice of it, only when that occurs is recognition in its full sense going to be possible. The presentation of itself, however, as the pure abstraction of self-consciousness consists in showing itself as the pure negation of its objective mode or in showing that it is not attached to any specific existence, not to the individuality common to existence as such, that it is not attached to life. This presentation is a twofold action, action on the part of the other and action on its own part. Insofar as it is the action of the other, each seeks the death of the other. But in doing so, the second kind of action, action on its own part, is also involved. For the former involves the staking of its own life. Thus the relation of the two self-conscious individuals is such that they prove themselves and each other through a life and death struggle. They must engage in this struggle. For they must raise their certainty of being for themselves to truth, both in the case of the other and in their own case. And it is only through staking one's life that freedom is won. Only thus is it proved that for self-consciousness, its essential being is not just being, not the immediate form in which it appears, not its submergence in the expanse of life, but rather that there is nothing present in it which could not be regarded as a vanishing moment, that it is only pure being for self. The individual who has not risked his life may well be recognized as a person, but he has not attained to the truth of this recognition as an independent self-consciousness. Similarly, just as each stakes his own life, so each must seek the other's death, for it values the other no more than itself. Its essential being is present to itself in the form of an other. It is outside of itself and must rid itself of its self-externality. The other is an immediate consciousness entangled in a variety of relationships, and it must regard its otherness as a pure being for self or as an absolute negation. In paragraph 187, we now come to one of Hegel's most famous moments of the phenomenology of spirit. That is the struggle or battle to the death that takes place between the two reciprocally related self-consciousnesses, the confrontation of self with the other in the most naked way. And I, I actually took a phrase that occurs a little bit later on in the paragraph as a, a somewhat tongue-in-cheek way of talking about this, you know, the struggle to the death 
Or, and if we think about like, you know, how to win friends and influence people or, you know, on any of these sort of things, how to raise one's self-certainty to truth. This is what you need to go through if you want to engage in the kind of psychological self-help that's required to truly become an individual. Um, here we actually sound a little bit more like, you know, cheap uh, versions of Nietzsche rather than Hegel. But that's really what's going on in this, in this, in this passage. I, you know, I, it has occurred to me as I'm reading through it, another uh, meme that's been circulating around quite a bit also fits into this quite well as a question that the reader might be asking at that this point, and that's the, boy, that escalated quick meme, right? <laughs> when you see somebody who has a little tiff and suddenly they're burning the office down or, you know, any other sort of very over-the-top reaction. Why do the two self-consciousnesses have to try to kill each other? Isn't that a, a strange way for things to, to, you know, proceed? You know, we have one self-consciousness coming along over here and it runs into another self-consciousness over here and there's this interplay of recognizing that there's something similar to oneself and the other and now suddenly they're going to kill each other. Why does it have to go that way? Well, Hegel does see an inherent necessity involved in this. And it's not just that as human beings, we're, we're driven by homicidal impulses or we're all sadists deep down inside. No, it really has to do with this, this uh, uh, what we might call, at least at first, tragic structure of recognition that's going on, that's going to get mediated later on into something much better. But at first has to involve this throwing oneself into the balance. So let's see how this proceeds. He says, The presentation of itself as the pure abstraction of self-consciousness consists in showing itself as the pure negation of its objective mode. Great. So now it actually starts to sound as if maybe self-consciousnesses are going to try to kill each other, which is a very determinate, very visceral act, because they're doing metaphysics. Well, you know, yes, that's true, but it's metaphysics of, of the nature of the person. He says this, he calls this a pure negation of their objective mode. Why does that matter? Well, you know, they're trying to come to an understanding of what indeed they are, each one. What am I? What am I? Um, and they're, they're trying to make sense of this by getting away from any sort of specific existence, by getting away from any attachment to the realm of what Hegel was calling life, the merely living, the determinant in, in that respect. So he says, um, you know, this is a showing itself as the pure negation of its objective mode, what I can see myself as, what I, what I take myself to be at first. Not, or, or in showing it's not attached to any specific existence, not to the individuality common to existence as such, not to just being this person here, that it's not attached to life. So he says, this presentation is a twofold action. And, and I've, I've drawn this in this way on the board, or rather schematically depicted it, um, to show the reciprocity that's involved here. Each self-consciousness, as Hegel says, seeks the death of the other. We'll see why it does so in a moment. But even more important, what it's doing in the process is risking its own life. It's throwing its own life, its own specific existence, its own here and now, its own possibility of being something essential, being something individual, into the balance. It's throwing it at risk. It's making itself vulnerable to other forces. It's not just closing itself up inside of itself. It's taking the ultimate chance. The only reason why the other can actually seek the death of the self is because the self is risking its life in the process. If it wanted to be totally secure and wall itself off, the other couldn't seek its death. But by going out to try to also seek the death of the other, it puts itself at risk. And, you know, think about it in a number of different ways. You can't attack a person without becoming vulnerable yourself, you know. Uh, if we think about it in terms of classical fencing, right? I actually, let me go off screen for just a moment. Um, now, this is not a sword, but this is a stick, you know, from Lacan, which is a, a martial art that um, <clears throat> was developed originally. 
in France by people who didn't have swords, but it uses some of the same moves as, as fencing does, because fencing is divided up into all these different quarters, right? So two different ways to protect your head, right? Both of them open you up to other things. Uh, any particular attack that you would make, right, would open you up to other counterattacks and, and so on. To be on the offense means that you abandon certain defenses at the same time. To take a defensive stance um, loses you the initiative required, in this case, to get you what it is that you want. Uh, there's a lot more that could be said about that, a lot of other examples that could be adduced, but I think you get the, the basic idea. So he says, this presentation is a twofold action, right? There's a twofold action going on here. Insofar as it is the action of the other, each is seeking the death of the other. Each one is going after the other and trying to subject it to becoming unessential, to becoming a nullity. Each is trying to treat the other as something that can be consumed. He says, but in doing so, the second kind of action, action on its own part, is also involved. What does this involve? Staking its own life, putting its own life into the balance. So he says, thus the relation of the two self-conscious individuals is such that they prove themselves and each other through a life and death struggle. There's, you know, I don't want to try to romanticize this into, you know, like samurais fighting each other or, you know, the individuals who get to know each other through sparring and beating the crap out of each other. I, I don't want to try to, you know, make that um, anything, anything other than what it is. However, Hegel is saying something here that even when we strip away all the romanticizing varnish that's put onto it, usually by people at a great distance from that sort of thing, and we think about people who genuinely do engage each other in conflict, and conflict where there are stakes that matter. Not necessarily, by the way, one's own life, but perhaps one's livelihood, perhaps one's reputation, all these sorts of things that we, we tend to identify with oneself and that we can throw into the balance. The love of the other, even, perhaps, right? Uh, the respect of the other. There's something that's gained thereby. And it's not only gained for oneself, but also something that is thereby being given to the other. And the other is engaged in this process of gaining and giving at the same time as well. That's how Hegel sees this. So if we go on, he says, um, they must engage in this struggle, for they must raise their certainty of being for themselves to truth. We saw again that each side can, can have a self-certainty, but it's not an assured self-certainty unless it also encompasses and involves the other. So by risking itself, it can get to know what it truly is through the other, who's doing the same thing at the same time, also trying to attain the truth of its self-certainty. Both of them are doing that. Both of them are engaged in the same process, but they're doing it in a way that's hostile to each other. So he says, here's where it gets, you know, a little bit more controversial, something that we're going to have to take up at multiple points through this. Um, it is only through staking one's own life that freedom is won. Only thus is it proved that for self-consciousness, its essential being is not just being, not the immediate form in which it appears, not its submergence in the expanse of life, but rather that there is nothing present in it which could not be regarded as a vanishing moment, that it is only pure being for self. Does this mean that unless we're actually like, you know, risking our lives at every moment, not just risking our lives too, by the way, by braving the environment or dealing with technological issues, but, you know, directly engaging another human being. And because we choose to, not because some government sends us off to war or, or you know, otherwise coerces us. If we're not doing that, do we not really have freedom? I don't think that Hegel is actually saying that. But what he is saying is that something essential to freedom is being expressed in this dynamic. That unless there is something at risk, you don't really have genuine freedom. Why not? It has to do with what self-consciousness is aware of. 
you know, and we could say much more about this, but I don't want to get I don't want to get bogged down at this point because we're going to get a lot of that as we go into the sections on spirit in particular. So he says. The individual who has not risked his life may well be recognized as a person, may well be grasped as a self-consciousness, but he has not attained to the truth of this recognition as an independent self-consciousness. So personhood is something that can be bestowed upon people, but unless they go through some sort of um, experience in which something like this is occurring, Hegel is saying, they don't yet have the truth of that personhood. They don't yet have the truth of that self-consciousness because they haven't realized just how contingent everything is, just how what seems totally essential to us could be taken away at any moment or could be thrown away by us of our own accord. This is a, a very deep um, insight that, he, that he's having here. Um, so he goes on and he says, similarly, just as each stakes its, his own life, each must also seek the other's death. Now why? That's the question here. Why does it, it, why does it escalate to wanting to kill the other person? To not only desiring recognition from them, to not only desiring them in, in whatever sense we do desire them, but desiring the death, the, the annihilation of the other. And, and we also have the other doing that in relation to us. And in a certain respect, we're desiring the other to try to want to kill us too. Well, why, why is that? Well, we can't risk it. Here's, here's one easy answer. We can't really risk our own life if the other person isn't going to cooperate and try to kill us, right? It's not much of a game if it is indeed a game, you know, the struggle to the death. It's not much of a game if you're, you know, think about it in terms of um, first-person shooter games, right? Uh, something that I think many people are, are quite familiar with. It's not much of a game if you play on some sort of god mode where nobody can actually touch you and you're just shooting everybody or killing everybody. Uh, it gets very boring very quickly, doesn't it? Um, we need some sort of challenge, there's nothing at risk if the other one isn't actually a danger to us. We might think about this in all sorts of other modes as well. Financial loss and risk, right? Um, what goes on in infatuation and relationships and taking a chance. You know, the other person could turn you down and just destroy you, right? Um, there's no risking without that. But there's an even more important point here. When I have treated myself through seeking the death of the other and risking my life, when I have treated myself as something that can strip away this objective mode of my being, that can strip away the immediacy of my being, the immersion in life, the specific existence that I have. When I say, you know, like, you know, very, uh, um, Metaphorically, I say, all right, I'm going to take off the jacket and I'm going to fight you. Um, if I'm willing to take away not only the jacket, but the tie and, you know, the chance that my glasses are going to get smashed up and uh, that I might, might end up in the hospital or might end up on the floor getting kicked until I'm dead. If I'm willing to do that sort of thing and treat myself as if, I'm something that can be thrown into the balance. I'm also looking at the other as the same kind of being that is likewise able to do that. To seek their death in a certain way is to treat them as if they're truly a human being. That sounds completely paradoxical, doesn't it? But at this stage of the dynamic, that's part of what's involved in this dialectic of recognition. Thank God we're going to get past that relatively quickly. And it's not all going to be about us, you know, going around and trying to kill each other. But that's what is happening at this stage. So he says, just as each stakes its own life, each must seek the other's death. For it values the other no more than itself. If I, if I treat myself as something that can be thrown into the balance, that I could risk complete annihilation, I also have to treat the other in the same way. Its essential being is present to it in the form of an other. It is outside of itself and must rid itself of its self-externality. 
that other is challenging me over there by being the same kind of being as I am, by taking the chance of getting killed itself. He says, the other is an immediate consciousness entangled in a variety of relationships, and it must regard its otherness as a pure being for self or as an absolute negation. So what is the otherness of the other? Me. I'm the otherness of the other. So that's why that guy over there is going to try to kill me too. Both, so both of these self-consciousnesses are attempting to raise their own self-certainty to truth. And they're doing it in this twofold way. They do that by displaying themselves as pure being for self to themselves, but also to the other. That's what's going on in the struggle to death. That's why things escalated so quickly. 